This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Yes, it's ladies' night again. You ladies will like this one. This is episode 101, the seventh part of the history of six-day races, running as far as you can in six days. In this episode, I will tell the story of the first six-day race in history between women, held in 1876. I have deep respect for the early women of ultra running who blazed trails. Now to the story, the first women's six-day race in history, never on Sundays. In early 1876, while Edward Payson Weston was taking on England in storm, embarrassing the British long-distance walkers and runners in that country, the six-day race continued to be of growing interest in America, this time among women. Some in the press called these female wonders pedestrianes. Was America truly ready to accept the idea that women could walk or run for days or hundreds of miles? Obviously, there were strong cultural beliefs during that era that it was improper for women to participate in distance walking and running. An editorial in the New York Times stated, Today it is the walking match. Next after that, soon the woman's vote will come. In 1876, female pedestrians were not entirely new. As early as 1844 in England, women started to attempt the Barclay Match, walking 1,000 miles in consecutive 1,000 hours, one mile each hour. See episode 18. Several British women were successful over the next 30 years. Often men wagering against their success would attempt to assault them to make them fail. In America in 1868, Anne Fitzgibbons, Madame Moore, a clog dancer from England, exported women pedestrianism to America. She began putting on 50-mile walking expeditions in upstate New York, wearing male attire during her walks, for which she was arrested. A few isolated ultra-distance walks were performed by women during the early 1870s. In 1871, Lydia Nye walked 30 miles in 8 hours over a rough mountainous road near Bennington, Vermont. She received national attention in the newspapers. Chicago, Illinois seemed to be the right place for women pedestrians to race for six days for the first time and gain initial acceptance. Daniel O'Leary had energized the city with his historic six-day victory over Edward Payson Weston late in 1875, see episode 98. Two daring women took the stage to be the first women in history to compete in a six-day race, Bertha von Hillern and Mary Marshall. Bertha von Hillern, aged 22, was born in Freiburg, Germany. Her mother encouraged and trained her in activities of strength and endurance. She joined in with boys in walking contests and she would outlast them all. They would gaze with mortified astonishment at the little figure moving steadily and steadily on toward the goal. She walked in several matches in Berlin and other European cities during her teens. In 1875, she emigrated to America at the age of 21 to start a new life, even though she spoke very little English. She made her way to the north side of Chicago, Illinois, where many German immigrants lived, where she continued walking and advocating athletic exercise for women. Von Hillern had interest in showing how far a woman could walk in six days. After Western and Leary had raced in their six-day race, Von Hillern boldly published a challenge in a Chicago newspaper for a women's six-day race for the championship of the world with any woman of unblemished character. Mary Marshall responded a month later. Mary Marshall, age 35, originally from Canada, started competing in 1875. Her real name was Trifenia Curtis Lipsy. In previous years, she and her husband, Thomas, lived in Pennsylvania. The Lipsys had a troubled marriage due to Thomas's abuse and alcoholism. Soon after giving birth to a son, Thomas died, leaving Typheria a widow. 
She left her baby with her mother, moved to Chicago, Illinois, seeking a better life. She worked as a book peddler, developed her walking skills, and took on the stage name of Mary Marshall. In January 1876, Marshall accepted Von Hillern's challenge, and they asked Chicago's famous pedestrian, Daniel O'Leary, to be the promoter and make the proper arrangements. O'Leary eagerly accepted and helped the women to organize the event and to train. The huge exposition building that O'Leary had previously competed in was preferred, but the owners asked for too much money. So O'Leary contracted with the Second Regiment Armory Building in Chicago, the same building that more than a century later would be used by the Oprah Winfrey Show. The interior of the building was prepared with an oval sawdust track of 10 laps to the mile and could seat about 3,000 spectators. Instead of a full six days, the race was scheduled for five and a half days, probably because of scheduling conflicts. The prize for the winner would be $500. Originally, it was felt that interest would be low watching a race between women. Ticket prices were set at 25 cents. It was reported, The admission fee was placed so low as to acquit the ladies of any desire to victimize the public. But as the event approached, excitement grew about this curious novelty. There seems every likelihood that the unusual character of the contest will draw one of the largest audiences of the year. The event was billed as a walking match between petticoated pedestrians, the Fraulein versus the American girl. The hall was decked out in both German and American flag colors, a great marketing idea, even though both women were from Chicago and Marshall was actually Canadian. Pedestrian historian Harry Hall said, Both these women were pretty desperate, especially Mae Marshall. She was in her mid-30s, and she didn't really have a lot going for her. Whereas you had this German immigrant, she could go back to doing whatever, but, you know, the hometown girl. And that's how he, how he pegged this, was this is the German Fraulein versus the American girl. And they dressed up the 2nd Regiment Armory. They had German bunting everywhere, and they had American flags. And so this whole sense of nationalism, which was a huge deal back then, especially against the Germans, was played up very big. The historic first six-day race between women began on Monday, January 31st, 1876 at 10.46 a.m. O'Leary was in charge of everything, including getting the judges to stop smoking their pipes. The German versus American theme was obvious in the women's dress. Marshall was described, Her dress is a red skirt with blue and white trimmings and a blue bodice with white stars and a blue and white shield on the breast. Her headdress is a black hat with a red feather and the other extremities are covered with red and white striped stockings. She wears blue kids and carries a fan. In contrast, the German is dressed in style having a red, black, and yellow short skirt with trimmings, a black velvet bodice with yellow and red shield on the breast, and plenty of other ornaments, especially light yellow kids. O'Leary shouted, Go! And the pioneer women pedestrians were off. Von Hillern had a shorter stride and walked more erect with her head thrown back. After stopping on the first lap with a broken shoelace, Marshall pushed forward with more speed and opened up a good lead, taking frequent rests as Von Hillern plodded along at a steady pace without stopping. A sudden cold snap made the building quite cold during the first day and made it very uncomfortable for spectators keeping the crowd small. Several large stoves were fired up to bring the temperature up, and there was a much larger number of curious spectators attending in the evening. More than 1,800 tickets were sold on the first day. The audience was composed of every nationality. A more jovial crowd could scarcely be seen anywhere. Aldermen, lawyers, capitalists, preachers, crusaders, and mechanics were collected in the building. After 12 hours, the two retired for the night. Marshall had reached 33 miles and Von Hillern 31 miles.
On day two, another woman pedestrian, Millie Rose, age 27, originally from England, wanted to get into the action and was permitted by O'Leary to join in the event. It was reported, She is a walker of considerable merit and wears a gold medal presented to her recently for having accomplished the feat of walking 500 miles in 500 consecutive hours at Indianapolis in December last. She did attempt the half Barkley match walk to benefit a beer hall. During the scheduled three-week event, the Saturday Daily Herald published a critical article about her, quote, as a shameless woman to appear in tights and fancy spangles before a crowd of lecherous loafers. <gasps> Rose, with her husband, stormed into the newspaper editor's office demanding that the editor, George C. Harding, issue a retraction, but they were told to leave. Then the little Rose of Paradise, without any further words, unsheathed her trusty cowhide from the folds of her shawl and struck the editor several blows across the face. The editor seized an umbrella and tried to beat off the irate female with more or less success until the woman stumbled and fell back. Just then the husband drew his pistol, but before any shooting had taken place, the printers had rallied in force and the disturbers of the peace were landed on the sidewalk in a twinkling. Harding, with a cut under his eye, pressed charges and an arrest warrant was issued which apparently stopped the 500-mile attempt. This bold Millie Rose was the woman that joined in on the Chicago event. She impressed the crowd by walking three miles in 33 minutes. By noon on day two, after more than 24 hours, the smiles faded from Von Hillern's and Marshall's faces like, quote, a free lunch before a posse of hungry beer guzzlers. They had started the race in new shoes, and the leather feasted on their heels, causing blisters to set in. Their walking was stopped at 9 p.m. for the night because of medical concerns. Dr. Dune, surgeon of the 2nd Regiment, took care of them, dressing their wounds. The mileage score was tied, with both at 74 miles. The two women contestants started day three at 4 a.m., their smiles returned and their eyes were brilliant as their feet walked upon the track, lightly as a sunbeam on the water. Later in the morning, they ate a large breakfast of rare steak, pancakes, biscuits, and coffee. Marshall became severely chilled when she stopped near a drafty window. Throughout the day, she was losing her voice until it was just a whisper. She hoped it was temporary and still was in good spirits. At 11 a.m., the sideshow pedestrian, Rose, started an attempt to walk 50 miles in 13 hours for a wage of $100. She steps rapidly and has all the movements of a well-trained pedestrian. She worked heroically, resting very little, gliding along the sawdust track at a rapid rate. Her light, buoyant step and the fine style were the admiration of the audience, who at frequent intervals applauded vociferously. As for the main show, by noon, Marshall again had the lead of about two miles. The building was filled to capacity that evening, including a good number of ladies. Marshall's feet were swollen, making walking painful. Ouch! And she had trouble finding the right pair of shoes that would not be too small or stiff. <sighs> she warmed her feet by a stove in the resting room, patted them on the floor in order to prevent the toes from becoming numb. She still expressed confidence that she would win the race, and said, Miss Von Hillern is an excellent walker, but I do not think she is possessed of the requisite endurance. I am now more than six miles ahead of her. She may catch up tonight, but then I will be fresh in the morning, and will again walk away from her. Von Hillern was in good spirits, and throughout the day was paced by many men who would try to keep up, but eventually left the track exhausted. Rosa's 50-mile attempt failed. By 10 p.m., she grew pale and began to stumble. She quit because of illness after about 11 and a half hours with only 38 miles. She had the sympathy of all who witnessed her wonderful powers. Both ladies began their day for a walk at 4 a.m., tied with 112 miles. By noon, Marshall had a six-mile lead, but by 6 p.m. it was all tied up again. 
Marshall looked pretty exhausted, and Von Hillern was very confident that she would win. The event was perceived as a great success. Our citizens seemed to be seized with a walking mania. The spacious building was filled with people, many of whom traveled a distance of over five miles to witness the novel exhibition. Marshall finished the day with a lead of only three laps. Marshall had a terrible night, not sleeping at all because of her painful swollen feet. They were also covered with, quote, galled spots which displayed the flesh. That's gross! She was pale, nervous, and again caught a cold and nearly lost all her voice. It was speculated. This task which she had so foolishly undertaken will work an irreparable injury to her health. There is little doubt. She couldn't get going on day five until about 10 a.m. Her legs were so stiff that she could barely stand. Still, she vowed that she would win the race or die in her tracks. Von Hillern started the morning at the same time. Her feet were in great shape with no blisters. She would generally walk in silence only talking to her German-speaking handlers and still when it was only absolutely necessary. Aside from a paleness, she looked as well as when she first started, her dress being trim and neat, and her hair was combed as carefully as though she was prepared for the stage. Her hands were covered with kid gloves, which as soon as soiled, were replaced by others that were new. Mrs. Marshall is pretty well used up, and sure to lose a few toenails owing to her having worn tight shoes for hours. O'Leary Shoemaker was telegraphed for at noon, and he brought with him several pair of walking shoes into one of which he jumped. Feeling much relieved, she made some fine walking during the afternoon and evening, and asserts that although behind her antagonist, she will be able to catch up with her. Von Hillern was now the favorite. She is of metal more tough than her opponent and exhibits but few symptoms of weariness. Mrs. Marshall's strength, however well supported by her will, is wholly inadequate to cope with the experience and training of Miss Von Hillern. When they retired for the night, Von Hillern was leading with 192 miles to 186. The Chicago Press thought Marshall was making a big mistake continuing and wrote about her unfairly compared to men who had also been worn out on their fifth day of walking. It is confidently hoped, however, that she never again be so foolish as to represent herself so shamefully, and it will be a pleasant surprise if she is ever able to resume her gaining of a livelihood by canvassing for the sale of books. Marshall started out on the last day courageously. Her feet were entirely covered in sores and were terribly swollen. Her muscles were stiffened and only the constant application of creams saved her joints from being in like condition. Ah! Von Hillern had left the track sick the previous night but recovered fast and spent a peaceful night sleeping. Her feet were only slightly swollen and her joints were a bit sore. She stepped out on the track, whip in hand, her hat decked out with white feather, and started out at the same time as Marshall, who strained, bit her lips, and had to be held up by two portly policemen for the first several laps. By the afternoon, the building was filled with 3,000 people. Marshall then picked up her pace and started to lap Von Hillern over and over again as the crowd cheered her on. With two and a half hours to go at 8 p.m., Marshall had caught up. The interest became intense, and the hall was crowded to its utmost capacity by a motley assemblage, all stretching their necks to obtain a glimpse of the walkers, elbowing and crushing each other, quarreling and pushing about at a dreadful rate. So great was the jam about the scorer's stand that it was necessary for him to stop placing the figures on the board, it being as much as he could to keep a correct tally of the book. Controversy arose when spectators and Von Hillern believed that the judges had shorted her lap count. The judges checked things out and posted an official score showing Marshall in the lead. Police really had their hands full in keeping the track clear of the walkers. Every time Marshall would pass Von Hillern, quote, a shout went up that seemed about to raise the roof. 
At 9.30 p.m., the score showed that Marshall was a mile and a half in the lead and still increasing the margin. Those who had been wagering on Von Hillern yelled loudly for her to walk faster, but it didn't help. Walk faster! Walk faster! Walk faster! The race concluded at 10.40 p.m. after five and a half days, or 132 hours. Marshall won, reaching 233.9 miles to Von Hillern's 231.5 miles. Historian Harry Hall speculated. The place was packed. It was just chaos at the end, and nobody really knows to this day who won the race, but the judges were terrified of their lives because everybody had money on the American to win, even though everyone thought the German won. But the judges knew if we declare the German the winner, then this whole place is coming down. So they declared just arbitrarily, okay, we're going to make May Marshall the winner, and we're hightailing it out of here. Both women were completely exhausted. Marshall had to be carried to her room. She was in such a terrible state that she was given opiates to quiet her down. Some thought that she was going insane because she wasn't able to speak. It wasn't until the next morning that she started resting better. Von Hillern came away in much better condition and was able to walk fine the next day. A week later, Marshall had almost entirely recovered and started making public appearances and giving walking exhibitions. As it could be expected, the reaction in the newspapers across the country was pretty negative. In Kansas, it was written, The spectacle of two jaded, foot-sore, half-dead women urged on by a yelling crowd to walk faster is one that ought not be repeated in a civilized country. In Chicago, There is talk of a match of other women, but the hope is that it will fall through. In Michigan, how the simple change of a single letter improves things. Let the female pedestrians give up walking matches for talking matches. Female attitudes frowning on the activity were obvious. If there were a husband at the end of a 300 mile route to be awarded to the girl who would get to him the soonest, the competition might be profitable, provided the man was worth walking after. But the Chicago Daily News knew that Marshall accomplished something huge. Marshall's fame, if she survives the fearful ordeal, is set for life. Other women athletes were very impressed and wanted to also achieve glory and riches. A women's six-day frenzy was sparked as other women wanted to get into the action. This will be covered in the next episode. Von Hillern didn't take her loss very well. She was disappointed that her German community in Chicago had not come out to support her enough. She soured on Chicago that seemed to favor Marshall more and was very anxious about her loss and issued a challenge to Marshall for a rematch. Von Hillern believed that Marshall won unfairly because she walked laps on the last day without shoes and stocking feet. She said that was against governing rules for a pedestrian contest. A silly charge because these races were so new, without such small details specified. Von Hillern also complained about the foul error from the dense crowd and vile tobacco smoke that caused her to faint near the end of the race. Others contended that somehow Marshall had been doped on the last day, coming back from being nearly dead to win. Marshall accepted the idea of a rematch, but a near-term rematch never was held and Von Hillern never again competed in Chicago. Like Weston and O'Leary, these two women became the most famous pedestrianes in the world, and nine months later, a much-anticipated rematch would be held. Harry Hall, the author of the book Pedestrianes, summed up the impact of these daring women ultra-runners. Pedestrians overcame traditional views of women's roles and put on performances that seem impossible even by today's top athletes. For more than 125 years, their story has been ignored, but they helped change the course of history. They set the stage for the modern sports model, the revival of the Olympic Games, and the suffragist movement. Stay tuned for more about early women six-day races. Invincible.